Welcome to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. This teaching is from the series, Jesus, the King Who Came to Die, a study of the Gospel of Mark. This dynamic, fast-paced book gives the story of Jesus the Messiah, God's Son, the King, who came to suffer and die to save His people. We hope this helps you understand and apply God's Word in your life today. We are going to again be concluding uh, the section on the parables this morning. We'll be looking at Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 34. And as we will see in our text, these were not the only parables that Jesus spoke. Mark has given us a representation. But uh, we're going to one more time dig into these to hear uh, as the Lord is teaching us regarding his kingdom and his work among us. So hear now the word of the sovereign Lord of the kingdom. He also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. And night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. And as soon as the grain is ripe, He puts the sickle to it because the harvest has come. And again he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed you plant in the ground. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds of the air can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. On August the 24th, 410 A.D., a momentous event happened. Does anybody know what happened on August 410? It's the day that Rome fell and was sacked by Alaric when he came in. And it was a momentous day because Rome had not been breached. Its walls had not been breached for over 800 years. So think about that. 800 years ago is about the time the Magna Carta was being signed in England. That's how long Rome had gone without falling. But on August the 24th, 410, Alaric sacked Rome, and many people were thrown into all kinds of consternation. Many even strong believers, such as as St. Jerome, the great Bible translator, said, how will Christianity survive if Rome has fallen? If the eternal city can fall, how can Christianity survive? Others, however, said, how can Christianity survive? It's Christianity's fault that Rome has fallen. It stood for all of these years unconquerable, and then within a hundred years of Christianity being allowed in the empire, now all of a sudden it's fallen. It's because of you, you Christians. A great Christian thinker named Augustine, who was Bishop of Hippo, therefore set out hearing all of this, and he spent 20 years writing his great book, The City of God, in which he described the two cities, the city of God and the city of man, and how God has been at work throughout human history and how the kingdom was going to continue to work and to grow until Jesus returned. And it was a a monumental work that has had, it's one of the the most uh, shaping works in all of the history of Western civilization is Augustine tried to consider this question of how is God at work in all of the things going on at this world, uh, we can sometimes think, you know, where is the kingdom of God in the midst of all this? Well, Augustine was describing that in this book. And interestingly enough, he died on August the 28th, 430, almost 20 years later to the day, as his city was being besieged by the Vandals. And they were about to conquer his city and take over. And you can imagine their, their name, we call them the Vandals, because the kind of things they were going to do when they came into the city. And so we want to ask ourselves that question today. When we're 
confused, when we look and see what's going on in the world around us, we can easily ask that same question that happened when Rome got sacked. How is the kingdom of God going to survive? What about the kingdom? I thought Jesus was coming and setting this up. What is happening around us? Well, long before Augustine had written The City of God, which is massive and would take you a long time, Jesus explained this to us in the two parables that we just read. And so we want to take time to kind of meditate on them uh, today to understand the nature of this growing kingdom. Now, these two parables are sister parables. Now, there are some distinctions between them. If you notice, I've got them highlighted in two different colors up there. The blue one is the first parable of the seed that grows. And the second one, which is in green, is the parable of the mustard seed. And there are some differences. First off, the parable of the seed that grows, you know, that the farmer puts in the ground grows, only occurs in Mark's gospel. It's not shared at all in either Matthew or Luke, who have most of the other parables. In fact, I think every other parable that Mark shares, they have those. This one alone is only shared in Mark's gospel. Secondly, note that in that first parable, the one that's in blue, Jesus really details the growth. Uh, and that's not done in the second one. In the second one, he talks about it's the smallest seed, and then it becomes a huge tree. In the first one, he details every stage of the growth and really kind of gives an emphasis to that. And the first one ends with a harvest. The second one does not. It's just a great tree. So there are some distinctions, but the two parables have so many similarities that they're clearly meant to be read together. Now, why do I say this? First, notice both of them begin with the question of the phrase, what is the kingdom of God like? Uh, so, so notice there you've got, in both parables we see, what is the kingdom of God like? Secondly, in the green, I've got the idea that he compares the kingdom to a seed. In both parables, what the kingdom is like is something to do with a seed. And then the third thing is that what in particular we are learning out of the seed, there's many things we could learn in seed. The parable of the sower taught us things using a seed. But here, it's specifically about the growth of the seed. So the two parables are alike in that they not only happen right next to one another, Jesus specifically says, what's the kingdom like in both of them? Secondly, he says the kingdom is like a seed. And thirdly, he says, it's specifically like a seed in how the seed grows. And so these two parables are clearly meant to be read together. Mark tells us in verses 33 and 34, look, there were a lot of other parables. He takes these two parables and he puts them side by side because he's saying, I want you to read them together. Secondly, he, they've got these very, very similar themes. And the similar themes guide us as we're about to launch in and read them. They tell us how to read them. Jesus is here telling us what we should expect regarding the kingdom of God and perhaps even more important, what we should not expect regarding the kingdom of God. They teach us how the kingdom of God grows and who gives that growth. And by doing that, what they help us to do, which we'll really kind of come back to a little bit in both the applying the word, and I'm going to talk about it in the after hours this week, they teach us how to live in this age. We live in the age when the seed has been planted, but we've not yet come to harvest. And Jesus is here giving instruction on how we can live in this age. So we're going to dive in now and look at these two parables and how they teach us regarding this growing kingdom. The first thing that Jesus is teaching us in this is the kingdom of God begins small and is seemingly insignificant. So notice in both parables, he tells us this is what the kingdom of God is like, a man scatters seed. And in the second one, he specifically tells us, well, what's the kingdom like? It's like a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed. And so the kingdom is like a seed. He's saying it doesn't, it doesn't begin like a full grown, you know, if we think of the kingdom of God, we want to say it's like the biggest sequoia that you can picture. It is like a mighty mountain, but Jesus says, no, it actually is like a seed. In fact, it is like the smallest seeds. All seeds are small, 
and all seeds seem insignificant. And in fact, he picks the mustard seed because proverbially in Palestine at this time, it was considered the smallest seed. He's not making a botanist statement here. He's just saying, look, we proverbially, when we want to talk about something being small, we talk about a mustard seed. I want you to know the kingdom is like a mustard seed. Now, this is a pretty shocking thing because, see, Jesus is going over this and he's been kind of giving this idea because what did the people think it was going to be like when the kingdom of God came? They thought it was going to be massive. They thought there was going to be no way to miss it. And Jesus says, only if there's no way for you to miss a mustard seed. No, the kingdom does not come with the pomp and the circumstance and the huge thing. It's not like a mighty full-grown cedar. It's actually like the tiniest of seeds. And this is why I said it's teaching us what to expect in the kingdom and also what not to expect. Many of the people we've seen so far in Mark's gospel how much opposition Jesus the Messiah has faced. And the reason for the opposition is he is not meeting the expectations of the people. They are looking for and expecting a very different kind of kingdom. And so Jesus is here in the parables telling them over and over again, you're missing it because your expectation of the kingdom is wrong. It's, uh, you, you've missed it by miles. And therefore, because you've not understood what the kingdom is like, it's not surprising that you've misunderstood what the king is going to be like when he comes bringing the, the kingdom in. You're thinking he's going to come and it's going to be a full-grown tree. He's more like a farmer scattering the smallest of seeds upon the ground. Second point that he brings up is, however, despite the smallness of the kingdom in its beginnings, the kingdom will grow, it will become fruitful, and it will be great. Notice, Again, we can see this in both parables. He tells us in the first parable that you know the seed is planted in the night and day, whether the farmer sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows. And in the second parable, he tells us you know, when you plant the mustard seed, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants. So the, the kingdom begins small, but he says, but look, there's an amazing power in this seed. When you put it in the ground, this seed grows. And in fact, it bears fruit. What's interesting in that first parable is note how Jesus takes the time to detail the growth. And again, we don't read the parables allegorically, so it's not saying, okay, what is the stalk stage of the kingdom? And then what does the head represent? And then what is the, the full kernel? That, that's not the point. He's saying, pay attention. The seed starts small, but it's not like even tomorrow you wake up and there's a full-grown thing. no. The seed starts small, and at first there's just a little sprout coming out of the ground. And then the sprout grows, and there's a stalk, but it's still not done. Then the stalk grows, and it starts putting out a head, but even then the head's not done until fully it goes along. He's kind of telling us there's this stage, so you should expect that there will be growth, but that growth is not instantaneous. It takes time. And, but notice that what he tells us in the second parable that's a little distinct is that it not only grows over time, even though it was the smallest garden seed, it becomes the biggest bush or tree in the garden. Again, now he's not comparing and saying it's bigger than a sequoia. He's saying when people would plant a garden, the smallest seed that they planted was the mustard seed, but the biggest thing that came out of all the seeds in the garden was actually the mustard tree, which... Uh, many, many uh, birds would come and, you know, live there in it. And so it grows so much that a lot of birds can even find shade in it. So very similar to what we've already seen, Jesus is saying, look, don't misunderstand. Just because it starts small, just because it seems insignificant, that's not where it's going to end up. But you have to recognize that. Now what's interesting is Jesus is doing this because the people that's not what they expected. But it's not because God hadn't already told them this. One of the great passages describing the kingdom of God occurs in Daniel, in Daniel chapter 2. And we won't take time, to, I couldn't put it all up there. We, we studied Daniel a year or two ago. But 
I want to remind us, so Nebuchadnezzar is there. He's the great king over Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar has a vision. And nobody can tell what the vision is, but Daniel prays, and Daniel is given wisdom and insight into the vision. And in it, you remember, there is a massive statue with four parts. There's gold and silver and bronze, and then there's iron at the bottom. And so Nebuchadnezzar's had this vision, but we'll pick up as Daniel's describing what's going on late in in chapter 2, in verses 34 and 35, and then again in 44 and 45 when he kind of is explaining it. And he says, so while you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. So next to the statue, how big is the rock? It's small. It's just, it's it's going down and it can hit the feet of this massive statue. But notice what happens. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. So what happens to the rock? It starts small, but it grows great. And how great does it become? It not only displaces the statue, it fills the entire earth. And then he comes back in verse 44 and tells us this. In the time of those kings, the kings, he tells us, are the the four things. There's Babylon, there's the Medo-Persian Empire, there's Alexander the Great's Greek Empire, and then there is the Empire of Rome. Okay, during which time Jesus comes and he's actually ministering. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain. So does God had laid out and said, here's the way things are going to go. There's going to be four massive human kingdoms that are going to arise during the time of the fourth one. God is going to establish the kingdom, but is that kingdom going to come in as a mighty mountain initially? No. It'll be a small stone that will strike at the feet of the statue, but then long after those other four kingdoms are gone, this kingdom will be growing until it's a mighty mountain filling the entire earth. So, Daniel had already told us the same idea that Jesus uses with the seed here. You should expect the kingdom of God will start small. But what did everybody think it was going to be? It's going to be huge. It's going to come with all of this fanfare and all this going on. And Jesus says, no, don't don't miss it. There's another place where actually he said, a lot of you are asking what the kingdom of God is like. He said, the kingdom's right here in your midst right now. I'm here. The king is here. The kingdom is here, but it's not what you expected. Now, interestingly, and I won't take time to go into it, if you look in Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar has another vision, and the other vision is of a great tree that is huge, and all the birds of the nations come in and they take into it. That tree, we were told, was actually Nebuchadnezzar, the great king, but now the tree is the kingdom of God. Okay, so it's kind of interesting. Jesus is kind of taking reference back to Daniel. And you may remember in Daniel is actually the phrase son of man. And what's Jesus's favorite phrase? Son of man. There's a lot in Daniel that Jesus picks up on. So he's told us this. And so it's a point to you and me, we should never despise the day of small beginnings with God's kingdom. Because let me tell you, it's, this is how God planted the kingdom. It's also how his work usually starts with us. And in fact, it's so much a principle the way God works, I get kind of nervous and suspicious when things grow too fast. And it's too readily apparent because that's just not in general how God works. Okay? God wants to work his plan out. He takes a wandering Aramean named Abraham and says, I'll make covenant. I'm going to save the whole world. And how long does it take? A long, long time. I can even go back further. You remember in the garden, Eve, a seed is going to come out of you that's going to do this. And then Eve gives birth to Cain, and what does she say? (laughs) It's here. Well, not exactly. He's going to actually kill his brother. Okay? See, we think immediate. God says, no, don't despise the day of small beginnings. It will grow, but it's like a seed. 
You can't plant it today and expect harvest tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. Then the third thing that we're told, and this is very encouraging to us, is the kingdom grows by the power of God and his word. The kingdom grows by the power of God and his word. We really see this in the first parable. So notice he says in verse 27 and 28, the farmer has sowed the seed. And then we're told night and day, whether he sleeps or he gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. So notice the farmer sows the seed and then his job is mainly waiting. He's just waiting for it. Notice the farmer sleeps and the farmer gets up, but what's the seed doing the whole time? It's growing. Whether the farmer's asleep or whether the farmer's awake, the seed is constantly growing. And notice Jesus uses this interesting phrase, all by itself. It's actually the, the Greek word is automate, from which we get automatic. Okay, he says, look, the, the farmer, what if the farmer lays there and talks to the seed? Does that make it grow any quicker? What if the farmer says, I can't sleep at night because I'm sitting here and I'm fretting? Does that make the seed grow any quicker? N no. The farmer plants the seed and then he waits for the seed and the soil to do what the seed and the soil do. This is God at work in the world he has made. Jesus here says, you know, the soil produces, but who really gives the growth? It's God that gives the growth. He's the one that's made the world this way. And don't miss this. It's, it has always really struck me. You know, you know we, we get excited when we look and we see on Mars there might have been droplets of water at some point in the past, right? Of all the places that we have peered in the universe and how many of them can I take a seed and poke it into something and all of a sudden it grows and produces abundantly? Yeah, one. The rest of the universe, it may be beautiful, but it appears pretty barren, right? But this one, amazingly enough, you can plant a seed and you can sleep, you can get up, you can do whatever, and it grows, and it grows, and it produces. And so uh, he even points out there, notice it's an amazing statement, he says, the farmer doesn't even know how this works. This is his job. But he doesn't understand it. I mean, and especially in their day, they didn't. Now, we've uncovered all kinds of things today about this. Can, but can we really do this on our own? No. I mean, we, we are dependent on, no matter how much we break it down, there's still this mystery that says, man, alone of all the places, you can put a seed in the soil and it grows and it produces. And how much more the kingdom of God See, our problem is we've uncovered certain secrets about, well, exactly what's going on in the seed and what's going on here, and then we are deceived into thinking because the ultimate point of this parable is not about how to be a farmer, but how to be a farmer in the kingdom, so to speak. Do we understand how and why the kingdom grows? We do not, friends. And there, there are all kinds of people out there that will tell you that. I mean, you know, this became a big deal coming out of the Second Great Awakening. There were actually guys who broke it down. For every dollar you give, two souls will be saved. No, you don't know that. Because you're assuming now you're causing the growth. It does not work that way. We do not understand how or why the kingdom of God works. And if we're honest, we've probably all experienced this. Things that you thought were going to go terribly and then suddenly God blesses, and then things we're certain are, are working and growing well, and it just doesn't seem to be that way because God is reminding us he's the one that gives the growth. And Paul teaches the exact same thing I'm going to throw up on screen in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This is the Apostle Paul who who's got this brilliant mind and all this insight into the kingdom of God, who's been taken up to the third heaven and seen things that he's not even allowed to tell the rest of us. Paul says this, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. If, if you're the kind of person that writes in your Bible, underline that. What are we? Nothing. Nothing. It is 
but only God who makes things grow. We, we are so busy wanting to take credit ourselves, but it can't. If, no, no matter what I do, if I put a seed in the ground, if God wants it to die, what's going to happen? It's going to die. And so Paul says, see, you Corinthians are getting all worked up. I planted some seed. Apollos watered the seed. Only God caused that seed to grow. It is so imperative that we understand this. And this is done so that all the credit goes to God. All glory goes to God. Whether we plant, whether we water, whatever else may happen, God is the one who receives the glory, not us. Because we're not the one who brings any of this about. Now, this is actually good news for us. Because you and I can be encouraged and we can endure no matter what is going on around us because God's word is going forth. God's kingdom will survive, it will thrive, and it will grow until Jesus returns. So you and I can lay down at night and sleep because who's going to make the kingdom grow? Jesus is, okay? And we're, we're gonna be moving into applying the word here, but this has gotta take deep residence in our heart. I say this right, there is far too much hand-wringing going on among Christians. My candidate didn't win. This thing didn't happen. I read a survey and it said, are any of those things going to determine what happens with the kingdom of God? No. What determines what happens with the kingdom of God? God does. The seed is planted and all by itself it is going to grow. Is anybody going to stop the stone that struck the feet from growing into a mountain that fills the earth? No. Nothing is going to stop it. So that means I can lay my head down on the pillow at night and I can rest because it's not up to me. I can go ahead and tell you this. We will not get there on judgment day and Jesus say, well done, you made the kingdom grow. Not going to happen. It will not happen. He may say, well done, good and faithful servant. You threw seed out everywhere. <laughs> you poured some water out and did it, and then you slept, and you got up, and you were patient, and you waited, and you trusted, and you believed, and I made it grow. I did what I said I was going to do. Well done, trusting me. That is what our call is. So how do we apply this? There are, there are three words I want us to focus on, and then we're going to come to the Lord's table. And the three words are peace, patience, and confidence. Notice, again, in the first parable. So the first question is, am I at peace regarding God's kingdom? Notice, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows. So, so notice here, it uses, you know, the Hebrew phrase because the day kind of begins with the night, okay? But what does it tell me that that farmer can go to sleep at night? He's at peace. He's not fretting. He's not sitting out there and working. I mean, th this is where his food's going to come from, okay? If, if, the, if the seed doesn't grow, he doesn't get to run down to Giant or Safeway, right? This is his food. But he's at peace because what has he learned through life? I put the seed in the ground, and it grows, and it produces, and uh, it works. And so the farmer can sleep while he waits for the crop to mature. He doesn't need to sit around and fret. He is at peace while it is growing. The farmer, again, doesn't even understand how it all works. But that doesn't cause him to fret. Who does understand how it works? God understands how it works. So the eternal city fell. How will the kingdom survive? Exactly as God intends for the kingdom to survive. Okay? He is at peace. See, and that's the amazing thing. I began with that today. Jerome's a brilliant man. But one might have pointed out to Jerome, how will Christianity survive without Rome? You do know they were killing us for, for the first 300 years, right? The question was, how are we going to survive with Rome? And we quickly forget that. And we put our trust in something else. But it will survive. What if America fell tomorrow? 
Will the kingdom survive? Yes, it will. The kingdom will survive and do well because God has promised it well. So many Christians today, we're not like that farmer. We find it hard to sleep at night because we think if I go to sleep, how is it going to grow? We give ourselves way too much credit. Okay, God is the one that's going to cause it to grow. Nothing is going to prevent the coming of the kingdom of God. So brothers and sisters, we're called to sow seed and then to sleep, knowing that God will do his work. Do I have that kind of peace? Because if I don't, what's that a sign of what's going on in my heart? Where, where, where does my confidence really lie? It really lies in my own effort. You know, and this is the thing. Look, you, you, you can love Jesus. One of the things that has happened, there's been a lot of surveys about this, particularly during COVID. The amount of pastoral burnout is insane. And one of the things that lies at the root of that is we can get wrapped around and think it depends on me. It does not depend on me. It's not, it's not dependent on these elders. We, how did the church survive when Paul and Peter got martyred at almost the same time? Just, just fine. Because the church was never dependent on Peter or Paul. The church is dependent upon Jesus Christ. And he's already conquered death. So do I have peace? Second question, am I patient during this season of the growth of God's kingdom? The Apostle James, the brother of Jesus, picks this up and says this. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. So notice he's using a farming metaphor just like Jesus did. He, he listened to his older brother and he learned something here. And notice he, he mentions here autumn and spring rains. In Israel, you get heavy rains at the time, so you, you kind of get the range, you plant, and then you got to wait, wait. And, and it's a period of waiting. But he knows the rains are going to come, and his job is to be patient. Now, what's interesting here is James, the very man who wrote this, in Jesus' earthly ministry, did not understand the kingdom and was one of the very ones who looked at Jesus, thought he was out of his mind, as we saw in Mark's gospel, in John's gospel. He's the one telling Jesus, you need to go to the festival. If you're who you say you are, you get down there and you make a big deal of everything. And Jesus says it doesn't work the way you guys think. Well, James has now learned. He said, look, we misunderstood the kingdom. Now we understand it. And our job is to be patient. Crops don't grow in a day. In fact, some crops take years to mature. I don't know how long you have to wait for a mustard seed, but, it, but if you start with an olive tree, how long does it take before an olive tree is going to produce? This is, this is not in a week or a month. or It takes a long time. When you, when you plant, I remember a few years ago we were out in Napa and they were having the fires and I was realizing, man, if you burn up a vineyard, you can't plant another vineyard and then next year I'll just have my crop. They plant really for 20 and 30 years away. That's really when they're producing. Okay, so they've got to be thinking. It requires patience. And so you and I, and this is again what I'm going to talk about mainly in after hours, we live in what theologians call the now, but the not yet. The kingdom is now. The kingdom has begun, but it is not fully realized. When you look outside, do we realize the kingdom of God has not fully come? His will is not fully being done, right? That, that's the reality. And we can get very distressed about that, but we need to be patient. In the New Testament, there's a group known as the Zealots. They had no patience to wait for the kingdom. They were going to force the kingdom to come. There are even some scholars, and there's reason to believe, that may have been part of what Judas was doing in betraying Jesus. The kingdom's not coming the way that, that I think it ought to come. So I'm going to kind of force Jesus' hand. I'm going to help him along, which might give you an idea of how bad a strategy that is. Okay? 
terrible strategy. God doesn't need us to try and force it. What the zealots ended up doing was bringing disaster on themselves. You cannot force the kingdom to come. But now, y- y'all work with me here. Patience has never been a strong suit for human beings. What about in our internet age? How fast do we expect things today? I mean, man. I, you remember a few years ago when it was like a big deal, like, I can jump on my app on Amazon and I order something and it's here like two days from now or three days from now. We were all like, this is like amazing. Now what are we like? But I ordered it like 30 minutes ago. Where's this thing at? Right? We, we live in a microwave age. I think I can stick it in a microwave and I, and I ought to be able to, you know, press a couple of buttons and 30 seconds from now I want it. Well, let me explain. God has not changed the nature of the kingdom. He's not said, oh, now you've got the internet and everything's instantaneous, so the kingdom's going to change nature. The kingdom is like the internet. No, it's not. The kingdom is like a seed. That means it's a, it's a great temptation for us And we can no more make the kingdom grow uh, and come to fullness than a farmer can make a crop mature ahead of schedule. If that farmer sits out there impatiently, fretting, worrying, trying to make that crop grow quick, is it going to grow any quicker? In fact, if he tries to do that, what's probably going to happen? It's probably going to kill it, is what you're going to do. I mean, you know, there's only so much water I can give, only so much I can do, it takes its time to mature. And in fact, one of the things, you know, which we've come through, and we find this all the time, in the food industry and all this, we tell ourselves, here, we've come up with a way where you can do it quicker and get the same quality. Is that true? No, it is not. There's a thing of, you start a vineyard, you got to wait 20 or 30 years to get the grapes that are good enough. You take the grapes, you do them, then you got to put them in a barrel. It's got to sit there. Then it's got to go into a bottle. It's got to sit there. And if you shorten the time, you get a lousy product. God doesn't shorten the time. But we are tempted to be impatient. Am I giving into that temptation? Third thing is am I confident? Peace and patience, but then am I confident that God's kingdom is going to grow? Again, notice in the, in the second parable, it's like a mustard seed, small a seed you plant, but when it grows, it grows. And there are going to be birds coming in from everywhere to find shade. Jesus wants us to be pow- uh, confident in the power of God's word to grow his kingdom. And note, it's, it's not without point that Mark began his parables with the parable of the sower and he ends with the parable of the mustard seed and in both of them the seed grows and it produces this in one it produces a crop up to a hundred times what was sown and in the other it grows and it becomes this massive tree where all these birds go. In the one there's all these obstacles that seem like there's never going to be a crop. In the other it's just this tiny little seed that seems so fragile. But in both of them, no, it overcomes all of that and it actually grows. This is the point that Jesus is doing. All the parables in Mark 4 are showing us that God's kingdom will come and it will be fully revealed, but it will do so in God's time. And so it's important for us to to not give in to the temptation, to see and focus on all the obstacles and a lack of visible growth or fruit, okay? You could ask, you know, we have farmers in this area that have recently planted seed. What if I went to them and said, you know, how's the crop? Well, right now it's nothing, okay? But, but what does the farmer know? It's, it's going to produce in its time. Again, no point in fretting and looking. It's not the season yet for it to come. But it's easy for us to look around the kingdom and every time there seems to be a setback to suddenly lose our confidence that God is actually going to accomplish his work. And consider this. The kingdom of God began so small. Jesus is telling these parables because he's the sower. He's done this. And so many people missed him. They didn't understand. 
that they didn't recognize him for who he was. What did we do with the sower when he was sowing the, the kingdom? We killed him, right? Appears to be the end. He's raised from the dead. But the church is this small ragtag group and the, the mighty Roman Empire is arrayed against it. They are being persecuted by the unbelieving portion of God's uh, Old Testament covenant people. Uh, it seems so much has been torn against it. Not to mention that back in the days when this is going on, did they even know that there were tribes living over here in North America? They didn't even know that there was a North America. They had no scope of how big the world was. But I want you to consider today how far is the kingdom of God spread? The kingdom has spread more in the last century than it had done since God gave the promise of the Garden of Eden all the way up to this century. The growth is not slowing. Growth is actually accelerating. And so it's imperative for us to understand God's kingdom is growing. And, and I want to encourage, don't give in to all the things that want to try and make us fit. There's all kinds of studies. Religion is dying. You know, the Christian faith is not going to survive. Don't believe all that stuff. How do we know that the faith is going to survive? God's promised it's going to. It does not matter. I, I, I don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. It may be that someday... It's not going to be Captain Picard or whoever, but maybe we'll be out there on some kind of ships floating around and doing all this. But you know what will survive through all of that? The kingdom of God. It is going to survive. In Augustine's day, how will the kingdom survive if Rome has fallen? And the answer is, it survived just fine. Barbarians come in and conquer Rome and the gospel conquers the barbarians. And then the gospel gets to the British Isles, and the Vikings come in, and they're raiding, and they're taking everything away, and the gospel conquers the Vikings. We can see this pattern over and over again. Today, Islam is there and is persecuting the church in many places. There is communism. There is just our secularism here in the West, are any of those things going to prevent the kingdom of God from growing? No. Of all people, we should be confident. And, and this is the root thing, because if I don't believe this, I won't be patient. I'm going to try and help God along, and I will not sleep at night until I see it. But if I am confident that it does not matter what the latest poll says, it does not matter what happens in the election, it does not matter what the media is doing, all these people are arrayed against the kingdom, none of that's going to change anything. Because God's kingdom is going to grow because he has promised that it will grow. And this is why Jesus has given us the parables. And I want you to again think through this. He gave them as parables because they require us to stop slow down, meditate, turn this over, because the more I do that, the more it sinks down. Because we have been so formed and fashioned and shaped by our world to misunderstand the nature of the kingdom, to misunderstand the nature of God's work, that it is easy for me to lose my confidence that God is keeping his word, to become impatient, to be completely lacking peace. But if we let the parables do their work, then they can make us confident, patient, and full of peace. Now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to come to the Lord's table in just a moment. And the same king that has told us these parables invites us here to the table. And he invites us to the table in this age. See, want to be glorious on the final day when Jesus is returned. We've been raised from the dead. There is no more sin, no more sickness, no more sorrow. You and I are perfect. And there is no one resisting the will of God. And we sit and eat and drink. Won't that be a wonderful day? And that's going to be amazing. But right now, are there enemies? They're all around. But Jesus doesn't say, wait until all the enemies are put down, then you can sit and eat at the table. He says, no, right here in the presence of your enemies, I bring you into a feast. 
I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to comfort you. And it helps us as we are waiting. Now, what I want to encourage us to do before we come to the table is I want us to, to take just a minute to, um, we're, we're going to take a minute and let the Holy Spirit speak. Is there any area where my misunderstanding of the kingdom is leaving me lacking peace? I can't sleep at night. Lacking patience. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to work and to get it done, which ends up leading me into, you know, when I was a dad, one of the ways I sinned, and I had to memorize Bible verses to help me with this, is if my kids were not responding the way I wanted, then I'm going to make them respond the way I want. Who thinks that ended well? It, see, it doesn't end well. I then get upset, lose my temper, and God has to speak to me through James and say, you know, man's anger does not bring about the work of God. It, it, it doesn't, okay? And, and it may be that we're lacking just honestly confidence that God will do what God has promised to do. So I'm going to be reading out of Isaiah 55, and then we'll, uh, you know, do the institution of the supper. But before we take it, you can start even now. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Is there one of these areas, is there some area in life that you look at and say, I know God has promised, but I'm finding it hard to wait. I'm finding it hard to trust. And let the Spirit speak and minister to that. Now I'm going to read out of Isaiah 55. This is the last half of Isaiah 55. But hear the Lord's word to us uh, as we prepare to come to this table. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So you will go out with joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the pine tree and instead of the briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown for an everlasting sign which will not be destroyed. The Lord has promised whatever word he has spoken, whatever promise he has made to you, it will not return void. So let's, we'll actually take a moment right now just to let the Lord speak. And if he brings to mind any area where you're struggling to trust him, let's take that to him and receive from his Holy Spirit what I received from the Lord, I pass on to you that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is poured out so that your sins may be forgiven. Drink from this all of you in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, you are the faithful God, making and keeping covenant for a thousand generations. But we are fickle like shifting shadows, quick to forget your past faithfulness when temptations, troubles, and trials arise. 
Lord, when the sin of Adam and Eve was still fresh, in your mercy you promised a seed who would come to work salvation for us. But as the centuries passed, most forgot this gracious promise, believing the deceptions of this world rather than your covenant word. But in the fullness of time, you sent forth Jesus, born of a woman and born under the law, to redeem us. And then rather re receiving him as our king, Lord, we put him to death. Like a seed, he was planted in the earth in death, but he rose to life, the first fruits of all who would rise from the dead. And so we give you thanks for his great sacrifice and we receive this sacramental bread now in faith that he is the fulfillment of all your promises. Brothers and sisters, take and eat. Lord, we humbly confess that it was not simply our fathers and mothers who sinned. For we too have sinned in thought, word, and deed. To atone for our sins, you shed your blood, paying the debt we owed, removing our sins as far as the east is from the west, and sealing the covenant forever. So Lord, we give you thanks for this great sacrifice, and we receive the sacramental cup now in faith that all of our sins are forgiven and that all of your promises are true and are given to us in Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, take and drink. Would you stand with me as we conclude? And as I cry out to the Holy Spirit, I encourage you to do the same, especially regarding whatever area the Lord might have brought to your mind. Lord, your kingdom has been planted and is growing throughout the earth. For 2,000 years now, it has grown and spread and flourished. Lord, Satan has tried to steal the seed of the word. The world has tried to persecute your followers. Our flesh has tried to lure us away with false pleasures. But your kingdom has endured through it all. But Lord, we still await the final day when Jesus returns, when faith will be sight, when the kingdoms of this world will fade and your kingdom will be seen by all. So we cry out now, Spirit of God, give us peace in this age of turmoil. Spirit of God, give us patience so that we might stand firm as we wait for Jesus' return. Spirit of God, give us confidence that though Satan may rage, though the leaders of this age may conspire, the will of our God will be done. The kingdom of God will come in all of its glorious fullness. And having done that, Lord, empower us to labor faithfully until that day, patiently, and confidently sowing the seed of your word, knowing that it will not return void, but will accomplish all you desire and everything you have promised. Lord, do this in us by your Holy Spirit, by your power, Lord, for your glory and our good. We ask all of this in the name of the Lord Jesus our present and coming King. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You are blessed. You are blessed to overflowing with inexhaustible supply. So go forth and be a blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you for listening to the teaching ministry of Bay Ridge Christian Church. For more teachings and resources, please visit www.brcc.church.